Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this ISSM webinar on what is distraction during sex and why is it demential? My name is Anna Maria Giraldi. I'm the president of the society, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this very exciting topic. And we have a lot of people signing up for the webinar. Can I have the next slide? So maybe some of you haven't been in touch with uh, our webinars before, or maybe you haven't even been in touch with the International Society for Sexual Medicine. So this is just to refresh for some of you and to tell some of you who are new that we have both a vision and a mission in the International Society for Sexual Medicine. Our vision is that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. And our mission is that we would like to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education and professional development on sex, human sexual health through the delivery of world-class publication, research findings, online and in-person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide. And we really have learned with the pandemic that webinars is a very, very good way to meet and discuss and um, increase our knowledge and fulfill our mission and hopefully our vision in the end. The next slide. The International Society for Sexual Medicine is built on regional societies. And as you can see from the map here, we have regional societies in North America, South America, in the Asian Pacific region, in the South Asian region, in the Middle East and in Europe. And we also have the uh, African Society for Sexual Medicine. And we also are affiliated with ISWIS, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. So we are really an international society. And we can also see today that we have attendees from all over the world. The next slide. If you are not a member, you could consider becoming a member. And one of the really, really good benefits, except from the network with people from all over the world, is that you will get access to our journals. We have one video journal, the Video Journal of Prosthetic Urology. And then we have three uh, sexual medicine journals, the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access, and Sexual Medicine Reviews. And they are all included if you become a member of the ISSM. And this is really where you will meet high quality research reports on sexual medicine. The next slide. So it's a pleasure to introduce our moderator for this webinar. And I really would like to thank you, Manuela Peixoto, for taking the task of moderating the webinar. Manuela is a clinical psych uh, psychologist and a sex therapist and researcher and lecturer at the Suada University in Porto in Portugal. She has a PhD in psychology with a subspecialization in sexology and works as a clinical sexologist and a therapist in the north of Portugal, and also as a clinical psychologist in the crisis intervention hotline in the Portuguese National Health Service. So she's a very, very busy woman. And she's also doing research in the field of clinical sexology and human sexuality with a focus on transdiagnostic processes of psychopathology and well-being. So thank you so much, Manuela, for taking time in your busy schedule to moderate this uh, webinar. And I will hand it over to you for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I will start by explaining the setup of the program. At first, we will have both presentations by um, our panelists. Uh, the first presentation will be by Dr. Stephanie Booth, and the second presentation will be by Dr. Marta Miana. And after that, we will start uh, a Q&I session, and uh, it will be for 30 minutes. And I will ask everyone to join us in this uh, through the Q&I button. Uh, every question you may have, please um, sign there. Uh, and uh, after both presentations, we'll, we will um, open the Q&I uh, answers. So I will start to pre present the, the, first, um, the first panelist, the Dr. Uh, Stephanie uh, Both. Uh, she will present the cognitive distraction during sexual activity, lessons from experimental studies. 
Dr. Stephanie Bullock is a health psychologist and an associated professor. Uh, she works as the outpatient clinic for psychosomatic gynecology and sexology at Leiden University Medical Center, which is one of the largest sexology outpatient clinics in the Netherlands. She's also a CBT therapist and a sexologist and spent over 25 years working with female patients with sexual desire, arousal, pain, and orgasmic problems, and with patients with other gynecological complaints without being not uh, medically unexplained. In her research work, she is specialized in uh, psychophysiological studies on sexual functioning. Uh, the experimental studies in her lab focus on the neurobiological and psychological underpinnings of human sexual uh, responses, basic aversive and adaptive learning mechanisms. Uh, the psychological mechanisms of sexual arousal and pain and on the etiological and sustaining determinants of sexual dysfunction. She has expertise in questionnaire studies on women's physical and mental health with particular emphasis on women's gynecological complaints and sexual functioning. She conducted studies on psychological and uh, somatic factors influencing sexual functioning with patients with several chronic uh, uh, diseases. So I will um, uh, let Dr. Stephanie uh, present her wonderful presentation. Thank you, Manuela, for the introduction. I will, I will talk about the effects of distraction or attentional focus on sexual response and lessons we can learn from experimental studies. Next slide. Uh, briefly, the outline, I will talk actually about attention because I think uh, distraction is uh, a lack of attention or uh, a different focus of attention. So I think it would be important to focus on the subject of attention. I will discuss information processing models of sexual response and also cognitive models of sexual dysfunction. In both models, attention is an important factor. Then I will discuss experimental studies on the effects of attention and distraction on sexual response. And I will end with implications and take home messages. Next slide. Attention, what is it? Attention is a cognitive and behavioral process where some sensory input is processed faster or deeper and has a larger chance influencing feelings and behavior. Next slide. Of course, we have a limited amount of attentional resources. So that means that there's always selective attention. So the majority of sensory information that comes to us is not consciously perceived. And we also know that emotional salient and biological relevant stimuli grab our attention, which is not that strange because such stimuli are important for survival. So sexual stimuli, but also stimuli um, signaling danger uh, grab our attention. And attention can be automatic or reflexive, but it can also be consciously directed and under our control. Next slide. So what about attention in sex and in sexual responding? Here you see the information processing model of sex, a model developed by Erik Janssen, Walter Everard and Mark Spearing. And in this model, it stated that for responses, sexual responses, genital responses, but also the feelings of sexual arousal, um, processing of sexual stimuli is necessary. So there's processing of stimuli by the brain and during that processing stimuli are evaluated and they can have a sexual meaning or a non-sexual meaning. And when there's a sexual meaning, they will elicit automatically uh, activation of sexual systems and also activation of genital responses. And the meaning is dependent uh, also on our learning history. So um, 
our learning history, the knowledge on that is stored in implicit and explicit memory. And based on that information, you make an evaluation of stimuli, whether they are sexual or more dangerous, maybe. Furthermore, we have also conscious attentional processes. So we can um, give attention to stimuli and we can also give respect, uh, attention to our responses, our physical responses. And when we attend to sexual stimuli and also to our physical responses that can result in the subjective experience of sexual feelings, sexual arousal. So attentional processes are important to process sexual stimuli, but also for our conscious experience of sexual arousal and also for letting those sexual arousal responses grow. Next slide. So what about attention in sexual dysfunction? This is a cognitive model of sexual dysfunction, which was developed by Dave Barlow in the 80s. And what you can see here is a response loop in sexual functional individuals and in sexual dysfunctional individuals at right. And what we look at the sexual functional um, response loop, that means that in a sexual functional individual, a sexual situation will arise the expectation of a sexual performance that will result in positive effects, that will result in an attentional focus on sexual stimuli, that will increase arousal, that will increase even more attention to sexual stimuli and also the positive meaning of that stimuli, and that can result in a sexual functional response. And that can result again in positive emotion. So here you have a positive response loop. When you look at the right side, you can see the sexual dysfunctional loop. So in sexual dysfunctional individuals, a sexual situation will also elicit the expectation of having to perform sexually. That can result in more negative effects. That can result in attention, more internal attention and attention towards self-evaluation, such as Will I respond or what will my partner think? What about when I fail? How will I look? And that self-evaluation attention can result in more arousal, but more fearful arousal. And it can result in hypervigilance, even more focus on negative cues. And that can result in a sexual dysfunctional response and even in more negative emotion. So this is the negative response loop. So in this response, attention for sexual stimuli or more for self-evaluation stimuli is very important and influencing uh, sexual responding. Next slide. So what about experimental studies on the effects of distraction on sexual response? First, I will discuss very briefly how we study sexual responding in the lab. Next slide. What we actually do is we can assess in men and women uh, genital responses. In women, we use vaginal photoplethysmograph, which is a small tampon size uh, instrument that can be brought into the vagina by women uh, themselves. And you can assess changes in vaginal blood flow with this device. And with sexual arousal, vaginal blood flow will increase. Uh, so you can assess, uh, well, changes, increase in uh, vaginal blood flow in women. Next slide, please. In, women, oh, in men, we can use a very simple strain gauge, for example, to assess penile responses with this strain gauge. You can uh, assess changes in penile uh, circumference. Next slide, please. Of course, we are not only interested in genital responses, we are also interested in feelings of participants. So we ask participants in the lab to report their feelings of sexual arousal, for example, by reporting their feelings of sexual arousal on a scale from one, not at all, to seven, very strongly. Next slide, please. 
And uh, well, in such a lab setting, uh, it is important to notice that we will expose people to erotic pictures, for example, or to erotic film. And it's important to know that they are completely private in a room, uh, so they are allowed to respond sexually. Uh, next slide, please. So what do experimental studies tell us about the effects of distraction on sexual response? Well, there are quite some studies on the effect of distraction from erotic stimuli. For example, studies in which uh, individuals are distracted, for example, by uh, being asked to make simple calculations during a viewing of erotic stimuli you can see that that decreases sexual arousal in women with and in women without sexual dysfunction. And you can see the same results in men. Also, it's interesting that um, when you look at distraction by, distraction by, for example, a performance demand task, you can see a different effect in sexual functional and in dysfunctional individuals. For example, the performance demand task in which individuals are told that they are asked to perform sexually as strong as possible, and they are also mentioned that their responses will be monitored. What you can see that in a sexually functional men, it increases their sexual arousal responses, but in with men with erectile dysfunction, it inhibits erectile responses. So this shows that a performance demand and you may say fear of failure will inhibit uh, sexual arousal responses in dysfunctional men. Next slide, please. Furthermore, in experimental studies, you also have the possibility of eye tracking. Using eye tracking, you can monitor where people look at and also how long they look at specific um, uh, parts of a stimulus. And Julia Felton used eye tracking in studies on sexual responding um, in studies in women. And she noticed that women with sexual dysfunction focus less on explicit sexual stimuli in erotic films, genital areas, compared to women with normal sexual functioning. And she also observed that a longer visual focus, more visual attention towards explicit sexual stimuli is followed by stronger subjective and genital sexual arousal responses. So that shows that more visual attention to explicit sexual stimuli results in more arousal and that women with sexual dysfunction, women with arousal problems, uh, show less visual attention towards these stimuli. Next slide, please. Furthermore, you can also uh, wonder whether an instruction to focus your attention specifically can help you in regulating your sexual arousal. And we did a study in our lab in, it was reported in 2011 in, in Journal of Sexual Medicine we wanted to know whether a specific attentional focus would be uh, facilitating uh, sexual arousal responses. And we looked at the studies by Oxner and Cross, who did a lot of research on emotion regulation by attentional focus. And they described a hot and a cool attentional focus. A hot attentional focus is a focus in which the person is strongly involved in the situation with the attentional focus on the physical and emotional sensations. While a cool attentional focus is more a, a position of an observer with a focus on more neutral, objective, physical characteristics. And we wanted to know whether such a hot emotional focus would facilitate sexual arousal responses. Next slide, please. So we did a study in men and women without sexual dysfunction. 
and we expose them to repeated presentations of a similar erotic, very brief erotic film clip, 18 times. Then we presented them a novel erotic film clip and then the same previous film clip again, because we also wanted to study the effects of repeated similar presentation of a sexual stimulus and also the effects of novelty. And we had three attentional focus groups in this research, a hot focus group. Uh, we had a group that had uh, the instruction to take a cool focus, cool attentional focus. And we had a control group in which we said, just look at these film clips. And we assess genital and subjective sexual responses. Next slide, please. What we actually found is no effects of attentional focus on genital responding in men or on women. But here you can see the results for the sexual arousal scores. So the experienced feelings of sexual arousal. You can see the responses in women and in men. And what you actually see is the responses during repeated presentations. And what you can see is that sexual arousal, feelings of sexual arousal are decreasing during repeated presentation of a similar erotic stimulus. And then you can see a novelty effect, an increase during presentation of a new sexual stimulus, and then a decrease when the same old stimulus is shown again. So you can see a habituation effect and a novelty effect. What you can also see is that in the hot attentional or focus condition, um, men and women report more, stronger feelings of sexual arousal compared to the cool attentional focus. And the control condition is in between. So what it shows is that a hot emotional focus focused on your uh, emotional and physical sensation is boosting your feelings of sexual arousal. Next slide, please. So another way of um, instructing um, attention is a mindfulness instruction. You may be all familiar with the term mindfulness, I think so. What you learn in mindfulness training is attend to the present moment with acceptance and non-judgment to the experience. And Julia Felton studied whether such a mindfulness attentional focus could facilitate um, uh, sexual arousal in women. So she did a study in women without sexual dysfunction. And what she did was preceding erotic film viewing she gave women a mindfulness instruction with non-judgmentally focus on sensations in the body and the genitals, or she gave them a neutral visualization task. And what she observed what, was that in the mindfulness condition, women experienced stronger feelings of sexual arousal, and there was also more concordance or a stronger correlation between their feelings of sexual arousal and their genital responses. So this indicates that um, a mindful focus with non-judgment of sensations in the body and attention for sensations in the body and the genitals is also boosting feelings of sexual arousal in women. So next slide, please. So what can we conclude based on this information I discussed? Well, I think important take home messages are very simply, sexual response is a result from processing of sexual stimuli. Attention towards sexual stimuli is needed and facilitates sexual arousal. Distraction from sexual stimuli inhibits sexual arousal and a non-judgmentally attentional focus on emotional and physical sex, uh, sensations during sexual stimulation 
seems to enhance feelings of sexual arousal. And that is something that we can use, of course, in clinical practice and that we actually do use in clinical practice. But I think it's also good to notice that there is still a lack of studies on individuals with sexual dysfunction. So we can say that it may have a positive effect in functional uh, men and women, but we should do more research in um, individuals with sexual dysfunction. So there's still a lot of work to do. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was a great, great presentation. I'm sure we will, we will have a lot of questions. So with no further delay, I will present our next uh, uh, panelist, Dr. Marta Miana. Uh, Dr. Man Marta Miana is a, a PhD uh, and a professor of psychology at the University of Nevada from Las Vegas having previously also served as its president and dean of the Honors College, uh, the author of numerous uh, peer review publications, chapters, conference presentations, and two books. Uh, her research has focused on genital pain in women as well as female sexual desire, past president of the Society for Sex Therapy and Research, Dr. Miana, was an advisor to the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And in 2018, she was awarded um, the Society for Sex Therapy and Research Mas Master and Johnson Award for her research contributions. She is currently an associate editor of the Journal of Sex Research, and she will talk about where are, we, where are we when we don't show up? The content of cognitive distraction during sex. Thank you, Dr. Marta Miana. Thank you so much, Dr. Pichotto. It's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you remotely today. So uh, I am gonna talk briefly today about the content of cognitive distraction during sex. Where do we go cognitively when we don't actually show up cognitively during sex? Next slide. So Mast uh, that one. Uh, Masters and Johnson really initiated this topic with the concept of spectatoring, uh, which we're all familiar with, that third person perspective during sex in which you're watching the event yourself um, critically uh, rather than focusing on your sensations or those of your partner. We then have, of course, Barlow's work and James Gere's pioneering work on the cognitive processing of sexual stimuli, which indicated that men are faster and more accurate in memory for sexual information and have a more involved network for sexually oriented words. All of this indirectly insinuating um, that women may be more distractible as they did not appear to be as exquisitely focused on sex during these lab studies. Of course, Dr. Both uh, has showed us repeatedly that attentional focus has a substantial regulatory effect on arousal. And of course, we have lots of subsequent studies indicating um, by my distinguished colleagues that the bottom line is that cognitive distraction away from sexual stimuli can have a significant negative impact on arousal, on orgasm, and on satisfaction in general. But what do we know about the content, the content of cognitive distraction during sex? We actually know very little, and that has something to do with the methodologies that we have chosen at the beginning of these investigations on content. Next slide, please. So, um, next slide. Yes. Um, Dub and Wiederman um, conducted a study in, in 2000 on the content of this distraction during sex. And they focused on two main sources of distraction, appearance-based concerns, and performance concerns. However, when they administered a cognitive distraction questionnaire consisting exclusively of these two themes to 74 college women, they found that women endorsed appearance-based concerns as often 
as they endorse performance once. And so they started to speculate that maybe women consider bodily attractiveness to be equivalent to performance. In any case, the general distraction score was negatively associated with sexual satisfaction and orgasm consistency. So at the time, after reading this study, together with my grad student, uh, Sarah Nunning, we decided to investigate gender differences in the content of cognitive distraction, as Dubin Wiederman had only tested women. Next slide, please. So in a diverse sample of almost 500 male and female college students, we found that women reported more cognitive distraction overall than men, and they reported more appearance-based distraction than did men overall. Men did in fact report more performance-based distraction than appearance, but men and women had the same scores on performance-based distraction. Now, it's important to note that both the Dubin-Wiederman study and ours were conducted with college students. And I would like to make the argument that college students are likely to be more appearance and performance focused than couples who have been together for a long time. Now, the interference of appearance and performance-based concerns has been replicated a number of times in the literature. Carvalera and colleagues found similar sex differences, um, although there has been some variation across studies. However, anyone who is active clinically knows that the distracting thoughts during sex are much more varied than that, especially in the context of long-term relationships. Next slide, please. Nobre and colleagues expanded the content field with their sexual modes questionnaire, which was rationally and theoretically constructed to include other types of automatic thoughts. The male version, as you can see, included failure anticipation, negative conservative type thoughts about sexuality, and the negative impact of age on sexual function. The female version included failure and disengagement, sexual abuse thoughts, thoughts about the partner's lack of affection during sex, and thoughts about control and sexual passivity. This was definitely a welcome expansion of the content of these interfering automatic thoughts. But the list of possible distracting thoughts, I want you to remember, was rationally and theoretically derived rather than derived from a qualitative investigation that asks men and women directly what the content of their distracting thoughts are. So to me, a grounded theory approach to investigating this content seems ideal. Now, interestingly, uh, 10 years ago, I conducted a qualitative, qualitative study of 19 happily married women with low desire and I asked them in lengthy interviews why they thought they had lost desire for husbands that they loved and that they were once attracted to. Now, this study was not focused specifically on cognitive distraction, but a lot of cognitive distraction surfaced in the interviews unprompted. Some of it confirmed existing research. There were intrusive thoughts the women were having about sagging breasts, about expanding waistlines, about them wondering if their husbands still found them attractive physically. There were also some performance concerns as women expressed that whenever they tried something new in sex, they had distracting thoughts about looking silly. Um, and they generally did not feel super competent at anything other than routine sex. But the vast majority of the content of cognitive distraction during sex in this study had to do with much more mundane and quotidian things, with being tired, with being overscheduled, with stress, with other daily priorities that seemed more important than sex. Paradoxically, sex was the interruption in a life that was demanding a lot of attention to a million details. Sex was the intruder 
not the cognitive distraction. And so what I thought it would be interesting for you to see some of the quotes from the study that uh, illustrate this. And these are all quotes from different women in this study. Next slide. Having responsibilities and paying the mortgage and car payments and making sure there's enough money for accidentals and just plain doing what you need to do kind of takes the fun out of sex. It's better to masturbate because it's fast. And with my husband, it goes on and on. And it's like, are we done yet? It takes too much time that we don't have and I'm tired or want to go to sleep. And there are other things that we should be doing or the house needs to be clean. Next slide. If I have sex, I know I'm not going to get a nap. I have to sacrifice a nap to have sex. It's always a sacrifice on some level. I don't know how to get over this, but the whole time I'm having sex, I'm like, hurry up and get on with it. I'll be thinking about what needs to get done or that I'm running late or that I need to get ready for something or other. And finally, why go get undressed and be uncomfortable for five minutes? Why do that? We're pressed for time. Okay, we're going to do this before he goes to work. And I just imagine him checking his watch and that just makes me cringe. Not very erotic thoughts, right? Uh, and I've just quoted a few of them. Uh, and as I said, every quote um, from a different woman. Now, granted, all of these women had very low sexual desire. But my clinical work over the past 25 years has confirmed over and over again that the most distracting thoughts reported, especially by women, have less to do with performance or appearance than, next slide, with the pressures of overscheduled lives, with time pressures, long to-do lists that they ruminated on while having sex, worries about children or impending deadlines at work, financial concerns, sleep deprivation, and plain fatigue. And I have to tell you, in the last two years, I've been noticing a new trend in distracting thoughts, which I never thought I'd see. Next slide. And these are intrusive thoughts about the state of the world. The pandemic and its lockdowns were supposed to produce a new baby boom. But no, most of the research is indicating that sexual activity has decreased significantly, and not just in the dating world, in marriages. But it's more than that. COVID has had a huge impact on psychological distress, which we have yet to fully appreciate, and it is showing up in cognitive distraction during sex. Additionally, the highly charged um, political situation here in the US and in American context, and I know other countries have their versions of this happening right now, um, also have had an effect on mood and rumination. Never in my clinical practice have I had to recommend to people to take holidays from watching the TV news as part of a sex therapy intervention. But I've had to do that more than once in the past four years. And finally, climate change has now made itself felt in a way that is impacting people in the here and now. Um, the world is feeling unsettled and the future uncertain. And I am finding that people are just not finding this uh, a sexy time, if you will. So these concerns about the state of the world are starting to make their way into our bedrooms. I am seeing it happen clinically in real time. So what to do? Next slide. My um, clinical recommendations go something like this. Sex needs to be prioritized. Um, it needs to be more considered more important uh, than those chores that intrude. We have to flip that script. Timing is everything. And this can be challenging because the timing has to be right for two people, not just one. But we need to choose well when to have sex. There are times that are doomed and we need to stay away from those. 
Attending to context is also key. Without being extravagant, creating the right conditions for focus is important. You may not want to have sex right after watching the news or reading something that makes you anxious. And also it's better any day to trade in spontaneity for a chance to center yourself in advance of sex. You don't want to rush in and you don't want to rush out. You have to find yourself before you start and stay with yourself after, savor it. It should not be treated like a fast food breakfast sandwich on the way to work. Um, we've talked about mindfulness already with Dr. Both, but getting well-versed in mindfulness before, during, and after sex can also bring huge dividends. And, you know, sensate focus proponents have known this for a long time. Um, Newcomb and we grew up in Canada found an association between mindfulness and levels of cognitive distraction during sex, as well as with sexual satisfaction, all in the expected directions. We heard about Dr. Velton's work um, just shortly. And there's a number of other studies, including some um, from Lori Brado's lab uh, that are showing success using mindfulness for the treatment of low desire. Now, although all the mechanisms by which these interventions result in change are not well understood, it only makes sense that lessening cognitive distraction is likely to number prominently among them. And finally, of course, self-care broadly conceived, exhausted, unhealthy people do not generally have satisfying sex. So my take home messages, next slide please, are that the content of cognitive distraction is varied. It is not just about appearance and performance, especially in couples who have been with each other for a long time. In fact, the pressures of overscheduled daily lives are much more likely to be intrusive to sex. An intervention focused on prioritizing sex, mutually attending to context and self-care is recommended. And finally, there is little question that we need much more qualitative research on the content of cognitive distraction during sex to get a richer and more accurate picture of where we go when we don't show up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your great, great presentation. We are receiving uh, a lot of questions. So I will start um, with a question for both panelists. Uh, and I will uh, ask, how can, how can we transform negative process into positive process which boosts sexual arousal. And then I think we are talking about attentional processes. Uh, I believe so. Well, yeah, I, I think as a cognitive behavioral therapist uh, that it's important to, to focus on, and uh, Marta already mentioned it, uh, at the content of, of distracting thoughts. What is the distracting thought and what is the effect of it? If people learn how that works, they can also, um, well, find out together with the therapist whether these thoughts are uh, true uh, or, uh, or whether they are helpful. And when they are not helpful or not, not true, they can think about more helping thoughts that they can use during sexual activity to, well, help themselves to relax and to attend more, you may say, mindfully to, to sexual stimulation. So I think that, 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 that is a very important thing. It is also a very important, I think, not to learn your patients to try to get rid of that thoughts because a very famous example is when you ask people not to think of a pink elephant, the next hour they will think about a pink elephant all the time. So you better um, train yourself in focusing on where you want to focus on and not pay attention to what you don't want to focus on. If I may add to that, and so absolutely, um, it's a fine line uh, because you don't want it to become, um, you know, getting rid of the thought becoming the distracting thought, right? Um, but of course, challenging the accuracy 
uh, of, of some of these distracting thoughts, especially when they're evaluative um, and, and negative. But I will go back to my point about context because I think what's important is not just challenging these negative thoughts, but to do so in conditions where you're likely to be more successful. Um, because there are conditions that are conducive to you being successful doing that and conditions that are not. Thank you. And we will have another question about uh, clinical implications. So what is the role of meditation in therapy? I believe we are talking about uh, mindful meditation. Um, in therapy, in general, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in, in regards to um, therapy for sexual concerns. Um, it's, it's about, um, you know, what, what Masters and Johnson started doing a long time ago, although I think we've gotten a little bit better about doing this cognitively with mindfulness, but it's about focusing um, uh, on, on the subject at hand, right? On, on centering yourself and focusing on sensations um, instead of letting um, the, you know, the world of distracting and anxious thoughts um, interfere uh, with being present in the moment. Um, so, I mean, I personally find it incredibly helpful um, not just for sexual concerns, but for just about everything and something that we all have to remind ourselves every day uh, to do, to be present and not to be always in some kind of state of anticipatory uh, anxiety about any number of things. Thank you. Um, we have some uh, another question about the, the quarantine period, the COVID-19 quarantine. Uh, and uh, a, a colleague asks, how could you explain the, I believe it's paradoxal effect on the sexual intercourses during quarantine period, considering that in some contexts, the pregnancy rates were increased in the last year? Um. You, I think, think because you, you said previously yeah. that the frequency decreased, so. Right, so pregnancy rates may have increased in some areas. I know that there are mixed results, but the majority of the literature that I've read has um, said that sexual activity um, did in fact goes down. Now, you know, it could be that that's the overall picture that, and it didn't actually impact uh, certain types of sex and certain relationships and pregnancy, but I, I don't know the pregnancy figures that, um, that the questioner is asking about. But I, there has been a meta-analysis just recently done on sexual activity during lockdown and the meta-analysis showed that um, it's, uh, there's been a decrease in sexual activity. Thank you. Uh, well we will have a, a, another question. Um, can neurolinguistic program be helpful in removing fear response from erotic feeling? Well, for me, it's hard to know I, because I, I, I'm not familiar with uh, this kind of uh, approach. But maybe you are, Marta. Do you know? I don't. I don't. Program? No. No, I'm not familiar with it. So then it's difficult to, to say something yeah. about it. Sorry, yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, we have here someone who said, great presentation. Thank you both for sharing your expertise. Besides prioritize sex, do you also recommend that a couple share more time together and also find time to reconnect? Challenging, as you said, Dr. Dr. Miana, thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, spending time together is, you know, when, when couples spend time together, the, the other concerns that are not part of their connection start to fade the more time that you, that you're with each other. So um, absolutely, that's part of the conditions is to be connected and not to be rushing uh, to spend time with your partner when you haven't actually um, made that connection strongly. So very, very important. Yeah, actually there are, are some 
nice studies done by the group of Muse, I think. Uh, yes. They, they looked at a, a daily um, um, connection within a couple and a couple paying more attention in, in having a nice time together. And what you see is that when people, people focus on that in the relationship, then their sexual desire is also higher. Right. So there's there is evidence for that. Yeah. So it's about context. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Patricia Pasquale has a, a question. She asks, I wonder if there are well known individual and relationship related vulnerability factors for cognitive distraction. I have been working with this topic for a while in research and clinical practice, and I think there may some there may be some vulnerability factors, worries, people who have high standards for performance, among others. My point, should we address these topics first? Uh, so if you can yeah, that's, that's Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, there, there are studies showing that people, for example, in men, I think a study by uh, Jacques von Langfeld, uh, that men were more, vulnerable or report more self-consciousness, for example, being more less confident about their, themselves, that they are more sensitive towards, uh, well, performance demand uh, effects in the lab. So yes, people, individuals will, will uh, well, will vary in their vulnerability for for the effects uh, or the, well the well taking place of uh distraction i think and more fearful people may be more distractible maybe yeah yeah and i think uh that's a great question from dr basquale i think attachment styles um uh, are are also key here and and anxiously uh, attached individuals will likely have a lot more cognitive distraction during sex because they are um, driven um, by, by concerns related to fear of abandonment and fear of being wanted and loved rather than the seeking a pleasurable moment with a partner. Thank you. Um... We have another, another comment. I appreciate your emphasis on prioritization, but you said sex shouldn't be a fast food sandwich. Sometimes that kind of sex is satisfying also. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I, I mean, there's no question that there are moments where, you know, it happens quickly and when you didn't expect it and, and it's fast and it's wonderful too. Um, I just see too many people who are trying to wedge it in between other things that they have to do, but absolutely, it can also be, uh, it can also happen in that way and be terrific. Thank you. Uh, question for both. Why not accept that they have no sex? Or in other words, is there a benefit in having sex and should that be part of our therapeutic discussion recommendations? For instance, the benefits for health. I'm not sure I understood the question. Did you, Stephanie? Well, I, I understood that the question is that uh, whether you should people stimulate to prioritize having sex because it's good for your health. Um, well, Sometimes I, I also think that maybe sex is made too important because I can, you can also be perfectly healthy, healthy without having sex. And it is also possible to have a, a nice relationship without having sex if you agree both and feel okay with not having sex. Uh, so, but there are also some indications that maybe an active sexual life can have a positive effect on, on health, but it can also be the other way around that healthy people are more sexually active and have more less sexual dysfunctions because they are more healthy. So it's not a, an, easy, an, an easy subject, I think. 
I agree. You know, uh, uh, of course, we're all we're all sex positive. We're in this field uh, because we we support that approach to sex. But I agree with Dr. Both that um, sometimes we 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 can overstate it. Um, sex is differentially important to different people. To some people, it's very important. To other people, it's it's not. It's okay. They they're functional. They don't have a problem. They're not distressed by it, but it's not that big a deal uh, in their lives. And I think we have to be careful with our sex positivity, not to uh, for it not to result in in pressure uh, to be uh, more sexually active or involved than than some people want to be. And then, of course, as you know, we have people who are asexual who aren't interested at all. Um, so I think we can remain sex positive without um, overstating the case or pathologizing people for whom it's just not that important. Thank you. We have a, a question that is, a, I would say a complex one. Um, someone asked, how do you help someone whose distracting thought is about sibling sexual abuse and they have low sex drive? It's about what? About, about? Uh, the distracting thought is about sibling sexual abuse. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I, I think you would you probably um, would have to engage in trauma informed therapy that um, that gets to the the core. I would certainly not be doing a very simple kind of cognitive behavioral. Um, uh, you know, get rid of that thought. It's, you know, it, it, it would have to be trauma-informed depth therapy uh, to process uh, that um, particular um, history is what I would say. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's very important to notice that you, you never start a simple sex therapy if there is a still a trauma and also symptoms of trauma, then you prefer to to treat that first yeah. before you use sex therapy interventions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Eleonora Delgado is a sexual therapist and I've been working with mindfulness-based CT and mindfulness on the treatment on several dysfunctions, including uh, hypoactive sexual desire. Uh, what I have learned is that not only decreases cognitive distraction and helps relax on performance anxiety, but boosts sensitivity, improves subjective arousal, reduces the erotophobia effect, and increases physiological response such as lubrication, orgasmic frequency, and even time to orgasm. I don't know if you want to comment or add some thoughts. Well, I think, I think that clinical experience is matching with uh, results from from studies on the effects of mindfulness, which were already mentioned in both presentations. And for example, the studies by uh, uh, Laurie Brocto also on the effects of mindfulness on sexual desire. Yeah, I think it perfectly matches. Yeah, yeah it does. Just a couple more uh, with Mary Clark asks, with a long history of negative attitudes regarding female sexuality, does addressing early learned attitudes have a place in treatment? Oh, uh, definitely. And we do have a long history of negative messages about uh, female sexuality. And I, I find them in my clients were the most progressive, the most liberal, but these are messages that, you know, um, we get early on, they take hold, and we, we still see them uh, widely. So um, I definitely do a lot of work around targeting um, those uh, messages, um, which are persistent and, and hard to get rid of, even when people rationally know that, you know, they, that it doesn't make sense. It's still hard to get rid of shame when it's been instated uh, when you were young. Um, so, yes, that's a big part of what I do. Thank you. 
just one more. Uh, sometimes I feel some conflict about discussion of mindfulness as it is typically discussed and practice around me, a sense of clearing the mind and letting things go. When in some ways in sex, I want people to consider getting more attached and hold on to uh, positive experiences and physical sensation. This sense of disconnection from the body's uh, experience is my concern. Hmm, that's a really interesting question, I guess. It, 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 it depends on, on, on how you're practicing mindfulness. I, I certainly don't um, uh, see it as a disengagement uh, from the world. It's a disengagement from the past and from the future and an engagement in the now. Um, but um, the way I perceive it is that that engagement in the now would involve that connection with your partner uh, in the now. Is I don't know, Stephanie. I I yeah I I I agree. I, I it's hard to imagine how a mindful focus can bring disengagement in the now from the actual situation. So. Maybe can, can I come with a comment? I, because we, we just did a study uh, where we added mindfulness to, to the regular sex therapy. And, and what we found was that people were less distressed about their sexual problem. I mean, they both had a good effect on, on, on sexual problems, but mindfulness, they were less distressed. But I think the mindfulness is about the non-judgmental. So, so you don't disengage from your feelings. You just recognize them. You feel them and then you don't judge them. I think that's the... I think the, the, the clue or, or, or the idea, uh, as far as I understand it, I don't know if you have any comments to that, but I think it's really the non-judgmental approach and that you just, you know, you, you, you recognize the feeling and um, you just feel it. Yeah, but maybe there is not a strong focus on getting into that feeling. Yeah. That may be yeah. the thing that is mentioned in the question, maybe, yeah. 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 So you 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 can you can see it pass. Yeah. So so you just well, see you the feeling, also, but but you don't judge it. So you don't say it's a good or a bad feeling. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much, both uh, and uh, everyone that uh, make this uh, discussion very rich. Uh, it was a great great talk. So now I would like to thank to Dr. Martin and to Dr. Stephanie for their both presentations. And um, I will pass to Anne Maria. And I just want to uh, echo the thank you. I, I think these lectures were so wonderful. And you can also see it from, from the, the, the chat panel that people really feel that it makes so much clinical um, value for, for them. And it, it's, it was really, really nice. Uh, lectures and thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge both the clinical but also the research knowledge i think it's so nice when we have like clinical practice discussing that backed up by by good research so thank you so much to marta and stephanie for excellent talks and for being here and thank you to manuela for um, moderating this uh, discussion I, I think in the beginning you were a little scared we didn't have any questions but we had quite a lot of questions so thank you to all of the participants too for for being here and participating and sending in the questions um, we have been more than 130 people here from all over the world. There were people from Europe, from Luxembourg, from London, from Mexico, from Vietnam, from Azerbaijan, from Mexico, I said that, from, from Uruguay. So we really have people from all over the world. It, it's so nice to have you all here. I also want to thank Patricia Pasquale, who is the co-chair of the ISSM Education Committee. She's the one in charge of these webinars, and they're just, you know, becoming better and better and, and people still visit us and, and join all these excellent webinars. So thank you to Patricia and also to the office who put so much time, especially Lillian in, in planning these. So having said that, we just have the time to have one more webinar before it's Christmas for those of you who celebrate Christmas. So the next webinar will be on December and it will be something completely different because it will be a more urological one. 
But that's also the beauty of our webinars, and that will be on Peroni's disease, state of the art of clinical answers. So please already now put it in your calendar and sign up and take care wherever you are. And I hope you're all safe and enjoy your life until we'll meet in December the 17th. So thank you to everyone.